So right now we're gonna go to the Museum of Afro-Mexicans here in Huehuetan. And we are about 40 kilometers away from Quajeniquilapa. So let's go drive two kilometers and go see what the museum is about. This behind me is the Museum of Afro-Mexicanos here in Huehuetan. I would recommend coming to this place. If you have to choose one, stick to the one in Quajeniquilapa. It is definitely a lot more bigger and has a lot more to offer and see. But this one is also good, it's pretty well maintained. And it's this place is more so of the cooking utensils, the drums, and things like that. So I would definitely recommend a place like this. You got a lot of the African cooking utensils. I'm sure like with some kind of corn or things like that, this is what's gonna be used. And this is gonna be for milk, I assume. Here's some uh, pottery. So as you would assume, this place, Huehuetan, was before a dominantly indigenous place for a very long time, before the Africans arrived in the 16th century, which is gonna be in the 1500s. Now this is a working community, so it's a machete, and they basically have all of their tools. I don't know what this is for, but I seen it yesterday. Now take a look at this man. I believe that's salt over there. I think this is supposed to be like a African kitchen or a teepee or something similar. And they have the containers. Like with many places in Mexico, they always talk about the great revolution. The Mexican revolution is before the Russian revolution the Cuban Revolution and many other revolutions. This is the great Pancho Villa. This is a black person here. And you can see this is Pancho Villa, but what I see in the picture is people that are more blacker than him, or just black people. They might be indigenous based on the photo, but this is Jose Maria Morelos that we have seen. This is the great Vicente Guerrero and we are in Guerrero, the state of Guerrero right now. And this is the uh, abolishing of slavery. And you got the slave chains over there. And again, part of the culture here is the dance of the devil, the bailar de diablo. So this is a mascara, this is the mask. So, all of, all of the things on the wall. Wow, take a look at this. This is so old. I'm wondering what this is. These are the guns of the olden times. These are the bullets. And these are the weapons. This is a rifle here. Interesting. Have you guys ever heard of black people doing blackface? Well, the picture behind me, or these people here, this is definitely blackface, but what I am told is that they are black themselves, but to make themselves look even more black, they paint it for a festival. And the only one who's not Moreno or Afro-Mexican is the lady, but I was surprised. I was like, wait, are indigenous people or are Mexican mestizo people doing blackface? And uh, they're not. These are morenos or black Mexicans becoming even more black. So black people doing blackface, isn't that interesting? Take a look. They got a picture of Malcolm X, Patrice Lumumba, Nelson Mandela, what is this, Martin Luther King. 
I don't know who this guy in front of me is. Shame on me. Martin Luther King, Bob Marley. You got Nelson Mandela here. And the reason why you have Nelson Mandela is because the embassy of South Africa helped fund this location. So you have more African instruments, the drums, and the kalimba. So this is really cool. Okay, this is the office, and this is all the pictures that they have. Okay. Ahora todos somos negros. You know, one thing I really want to know about all these countries, why do they always have the red lipstick? Every Latin country I go to, these are the things that I see. One of the things I've learned in traveling is that the game of basketball is huge. Much bigger than American football, much bigger than baseball. Because in any community in Latin America, from Colombia to Mexico, where we're at now, you will always see a basketball court. Every single community, it just seems like it's a very big sport. And it'll be interesting for someone to do a research project on how basketball became this big. So you got the basketball hoop here, and it's just super interesting to see. But let's not go all the way there. Let's look at the paintings. In Mexico, Africans came as slaves. But what I want you guys to really, really know is that a lot of times the Africans rebelled fought and escaped slavery from the year 1523 until when slavery was abolished. There was over 100 slave rebellions that is recorded. And I believe there are many, many more that were not recorded. It came to the point where Mexico City and the government did not allow any of the importation of blacks because they were worried that they were going to take down all of the Spanish people and therefore end the Spanish conquest of Mexico. When it comes to the hierarchy of people in Mexico, before the whites, the Spanish, those that were born in Spain were on top. Then you have those that were born in Mexico, but of Spanish ancestry, those were to be second place. Then you have the mestizos, the indigenous, and at the bottom, you have the blacks. And till today, it is basically the same thing. In Mexico, slavery was abolished December 19th, 1817. Many, many years before the United States and many years before Brazil. Antes es más moreno. Sí, había más moreno. ¿Y hoy? Porque se está perdiendo la raza. ¿Por qué? Ya salen así de color. Se casan de diferentes razas. Un indígena. Con una mi mujer, mi mujer es india de allá, ella habla musgo, otra lengua, ella es blanca. Entonces tu papá es moreno. Mi papá es moreno, pero mi mamá es blanca, yo puedo salir medio medio. Ajá, ya se va perdiendo ahí. Ya se va lavando la sangre. Igual mi hijo, pues como la mía salió güerita, y ya se perdió por ahí. ¿La vida es mejor antes o mejor ahora? Pues para mí, ahorita es mejor. ¿Por qué? Porque ahorita ya, ahora sí que nosotros, ahorita nosotros nos sentimos ricos, la verdad. Sí, porque yo cuando estaba morrito, no, yo quería cosas, a veces no las podía, mi papá no me las podía comprar. Y por ahorita yo como era mío ya se las doy yo. Sí, y antes no. Antes yo me conformaba con una, una, un bol y una paleta de hielo. Y aparte que no había aquí, no entraban cosas para comer, no, no venía la gente a vender. We are now in the town of Jose Maria Morelos. It is named after one of the greatest Mexican generals and of African descent. So here I am in a, not a museum, but something like that. And you can see they have the shape of Africa.
¿La vida es mejor ahora o antes? Pues yo creo que tiene sus ventajas y su de, sus desventajas. Antes yo te puedo contar de mi niñez que no teníamos carretera, no teníamos tanto acceso a las tecnologías que tenemos hoy, pero era un, una vida tranquila porque era nada más, se concentraba todo en la comunidad y había más hermandad, más hermandad dentro de la comunidad y este, los pocos que éramos nos veíamos todos como una sola familia, no había tanto egoísmo, no ha, había tanta separación, los valores familiares eran mucho más, estaban más radicados en las familias, era, no había delincuencia, no había drogadicción, no había este, tantos vicios como hay. El hombre cuando tomaba, tomaba tepache, tomaba alcohol, pero no como toma ahora. Entonces, yo creo que la vida de antes me gustaba más. Nuestra comunidad era limpia, no había contaminación. Yo recuerdo que cuando estaba pequeña, aquí a un lado está un arroyo que corría limpio, ahí nos íbamos a bañar, a lavar, a lavar los trastes, y pasamos una niñez feliz subiéndonos a los árboles de este de mangos, subiéndonos a las palmas de coco, cortábamos la fruta con la mano, no había tanta plaga como hay. Entonces, yo creo que vivíamos mejor antes, yo creo, porque vivíamos una vida más sana. Quizás con desconocimiento que existíamos, porque nosotros estábamos eh, aislados completamente de, de la ciudad, de, ni sabíamos de los derechos, sabíamos nada más vivir, vivir. Y, este, y ahora estamos luchando por un reconocimiento porque las circunstancias nos obligan a tener este, esos derechos como tenerlo cualquier otra etnia. Y estamos bien porque tenemos acceso a la tecnología, tenemos acceso al estudio, tenemos acceso a seguir preparándonos a tener otras oportunidades de vida. Antes la mujer nacía para casarse, para ser madre para tener una familia nada más. Ahora nosotros podemos decir, la mujer crece para ser madre también, pero para estudiar, para tener una profesión, para tener mejor nivel de vida económico, decimos. Pero pues también, te decía, todo tiene sus pros y sus contras. Tenemos acceso a la tecnología, tenemos acceso a una escuela, tenemos el derecho y la oportunidad de estudiar y tener, hacer una carrera, pero no siempre tenemos le, la suerte de trabajar en lo que estudiamos, para lo que nos preparamos, porque también hay ciertas limitaciones. La, 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 entonces, ¿la vida es más difícil? Ahora, ahora o yo siento que es más difícil ahora para comida, para... para comida, porque antes si el vecino sembraba maíz y mi papá sembraba chiles, el vecino sabía que tenía chiles, tenía tomates porque mi papá sembraba, mi papá sabía que tenía maíz porque el vecino tenía maíz y no este, se iba a quedar con hambre, se sembraba calabaza y las calabazas que se sembraban se repartían en la comunidad. Se sembraba sandía y las sandías no se vendían, se regalaban. Entonces, era compartir lo que una, cada persona tenía en su hogar, pero ahora no. Tenemos acceso a tantas otras cosas, a la tecnología, pero ahora hasta el bote de agua lo compramos. Y antes nosotros no se compraba el agua, nada más íbamos, hacíamos un pozo, sacábamos de ese pozo el agua y no las tomábamos, y sin miedo a que nos diera diarrea, que nos diera vómito. ¿Por qué? Porque nuestra comunidad era limpia. Entonces yo siento que la vida, con ciertas limitaciones, pero era mucho mejor antes. Welcome to the museum here in Cuajini, Calapa. This is a Afro-Mexican museum, and it is pretty big. So let's get started talking about the history of this place. Every community you go to here, they have something different to say about how Africans arrived. One of the things they will tell you is that Africans arrived on a ship, it basically fell, it got stuck, and they ran away. That's one of the stories in these communities. Other stories, like in Cojantes, uh, it's gonna be 
Africans came with a Spanish guy, and that's how they arrived, working the lands, mostly to work on cotton farms, uh, sugar cane, tobacco, chili, at least that's what the story goes. But here in Kuahini Kalapa, there's also another story, which is gonna be the Africans arriving from Veracruz all the way to Puebla or Mexico City, and then making their way down. Some have escaped, they're called Cimarrones, and then some, I believe, they're just gonna be slaves that were forced to come to this area. And this area is basically cotton country. If there's any ships that came from Africa all the way to the Pacific, they're going to be coming from Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, around that area, Congo, uh, Cameroon, all the way down to South Africa, all the way on the other side to the Philippines, and then making its way to the Pacific Ocean here in Mexico. So you can see the, you can see the indigenous people, and this is where we're at right now, Kwahini Calapa, Punto Maldonado. I've been there. This is going to be Chacawa. This is where you're going to find black people. So Chacawa, La Sufre, Charco, uh, Rio Grande is going to be here. Porto Escondido is actually right here. And anything on the Costa Chica, this is called Costa Chica here, the small coast, this is where you're going to find black people. And the majority of them are going to be on this side here. So, I mean, Santo Domingo, Tefescla, you have like a majority, majority uh, towns here in Cojante, Cerro de la Esperanza. They're not even on the map, but that is a story here. This is the ship that Africans arrived on, and it's basically going to be the same route from West Africa, a lot of times to the Gulf of Mexico in Veracruz. That's where Mexico began. That's where the first Africans arrived. And the first Africans arrived at the same time the first Spanish arrived. When Hernan Cortez arrived, that's when the Africans arrived. So African people, black Mexicans, have been here as long as the Spaniards. If any of you guys have studied U.S. history or slavery history, you can see um, this. You've probably seen things like these. Slaves at the bottom of the ship being sick, most of them dying. In Mexico, it is said that over 250,000 people, Africans, arrived. I'm probably going to say the number is a lot greater than that. And I'm also going to say the numbers that were taken from Africa is going to be way, way greater than that because the percentage of people that died on what they say is the middle passage, <laughs> that's what they say, is much, much greater. So on the slave ship, like they did in the United States, or the slaves going to the United States and all of the Americas, they separated the slaves based on tribes. So they did not speak the same language and increase the chances of rebelling. So you can have a Mandican slave, a Uruva slave, all of these tribal land, they had slaves mixed in. So this behind me is a mine, a silver mine, and a lot of the black people that came here were mainly brought to work on mines, mining for silver mostly, gold, also sugar plantations, tobacco, cotton, just working on farms, domestic work, anything. And to tell you, not only did landowners buy slaves, but all sorts of Spanish people, what would become as Mexican people, bought slaves. Notaries, they were gifted during dowries, uh, the military bought them. Everybody, everybody used slaves. They're also given as a gift to the nuns in the Catholic Church. So these are Indians that you're looking at. And then you also have Africans. During this time with disease and being overworked, a lot of Indians died. And the Spanish were like, hey, the Africans are good for this job. Their bodies could endure this. And still today, a lot of this uh, notion that black people are stronger and could endure more and that they don't feel as much pain still happens in sports, uh, in doctors, in many aspects of life. But they were basically brought to work here. On the top, you can see the cotton. This right here is a free slave. This is how they dress like, like the Spanish royalty. And this is a guy here, lady here. But there is also free slaves here in Mexico. But a lot of them are going to be actual slaves. There were runaway slaves. And the thing that I want to say about Afro-Mexicans as well as African-Americans and anybody else, their story and the story of these people in the Americas, Africans in the Americas, I would say is mostly a story of just like rebellion, of trying their best to 
escape problems. These people were the free blacks. And you can see them wearing the Spanish dress, dressing like the Spanish. Let's go down this way. This is some of the culture in the area. You basically have bulls, horses, cows. As we get down below, this is the dance of the devil. Uh, by La, the Diablo, I think it's called something like that. But the lady did say, she did correct me, she did say this is a 100% African dance, is not mixed with indigenous. Like I've said before, it is a 100% African dance. And you can see the iconic drum instrument. There's another instrument uh, here. I don't even know exactly what it's called. Is it called the uh, Kablash or Kalabash? Because I know there's like something inside. This is also a musical instrument. This is the jaw of a donkey. This is what some of the communities are playing. So here some of the local communities in this area are playing traditional African music. And there's also like a lot of traditional African dances. And this is like their celebrations. Uh, July 25th, this is what they're doing. And here in Kwahini Kalapa, it's basically the, the economy is gonna be based on agriculture and animal husbandry. You got cows, cows is basically the main thing. You're gonna have pigs, yes, uh, chicken. Yes, they have watermelon, lemons, mangoes, uh, lemons. So you can see like homes like this, were the traditional homes here in Kwahini Kalapa. This is not Africa. This is coastal Mexico. Behind me is a picture, a painting of the great general and Mexican president, Vicente Guerrero. He is from the state of Guerrero. Kwahini Kalapa is in the state of Guerrero. And he is black. A lot of pictures you do look at is going to be him painted a whole lot more white. Again, this is 200 years ago, so they're not going to have exact uh, portraits. Most of the Africans that were brought to Mexico were men. So here in Mexico, the reason why some people say Afro Mestizo is because a lot of the African men, they mixed with Indian women. And a lot of times this could be forceful, uh, forceful mixing. So the result is going to be a person or a girl that looks like this. So here's the father, the mother, and then the daughter here. And then on this side, on this side, you're going to have a Spanish guy, African women. This is also forceful. And then you're going to have a mulatto. Let me tell you what a mulatto is or where the word mulatto comes from. It's going to come from the word mule. So what is a mule? is going to be a male donkey and a female horse. But a mule cannot reproduce. So that is the justification, at least in the United States sense, that you can rape a African woman, a black woman, because she will not reproduce. And they are also different species. A white person and a black person are different species. So next time you hear the word mule, think about where it comes from and its implications. These are the black generals who fought for the independence of Mexico, without black people, you're not going to have the independence of Mexico from the conquistadors from Spain. So this right here is a turtle, and it is supposed to be like another African dance. Is this a picture of the United States? No. This is a picture of Mexico. To those blacks that rebelled, this was their punishment. Like the United States, and like many other American territories, black people were treated in a very, very similar way. Lynchings, killings, rape, and lots and lots of brutality. This is a white man, and this is a African man. This is also part of the tradition here. I believe this is some kind of dance, if I'm not mistaken. Here in this museum, 
they are including the Olmecs as African people. Of course, there's a lot of debate on that, and I'm not going to get into it, but in this museum, they are. So you have the Indians dying, the Spanish, the Africans coming, and it's going to go all the way to, this is Miguel Hidalgo. This is what Mexicans say is the father of Mexico, and he is the one that basically started the war of independence against the Spanish. This is the legendary Yanga. This right here is Jose Maria Morelos. He is another Afro-Mexican and general. The states of Morelos is named after him, and the city of Morelia and Michoacan is named after him. Again, like with a lot of pictures, they are going to make him appear a whole lot more white than he is. You can see the black generals, the black fighters that helped Mexico get its independence. This is another Vicente Guerrero and the flag of Mexico. So these are some of the musical instruments brought to Mexico by the Africans and the traditions. So to, until today, the balafone and all of these other marimba instruments are here. So you guys can see, I don't have any musical abilities. You're supposed to be playing with two hands, but I'm holding the camera on this hand. If you guys do want to listen to uh, this instrument, some of the best artists, some of the best musicians are going to be from Mali. Just take a look at uh, Tomani Diabate's album. So here you have the time of revolution. And just so you know, Mexico was revolting against all of these landowners who were owning so much of the land. Few people own all of the land, and most of the people are just workers. So do you see this picture, this painting of an African reading? Just like the United States, the Spanish slave owners did not teach their slaves how to read. And until today, a lot of the older black people cannot read. If you go to the small towns, you will find the majority, if they're more than 65 years old, the majority cannot read. A lot of the younger children can read, but in the 1960s, just in Mexico alone, 37, 38% of the population cannot read. And in the coastal part where the black people live, the overwhelming majority, 80, 90% cannot read back then. And 80% of the people who are alive today in their 60s, in their 70s, in their 80s still cannot read. Some of them are lucky enough to know the numbers, but reading, like you've seen in some of the videos, it's not something that's, you know, to be joked about, but this history goes all the way back to slavery time. This uh, miseducation and not allowing any forms of education, but just working and working and working in the farms. This goes back to the tradition of slavery. So, like I said, Africans came in the time of Hernan Cortez, the first Africans. This is the marimba here, this musical instrument. This musical instrument is the marimba. And this is going to be sugar canes. I believe this is going to be Veracruz. If I'm not mistaken, this is supposed to be Veracruz. And until today, or to this day, the, one of the biggest things that Veracruz produces is sugar canes. The few black people that are left are producing and transporting and working in sugar cane. So the history and legacy is still here. This is as time is changing, you have black people in the military. I don't know what this is exactly supposed to mean. I believe this is a lot more recent. Oh no, this is just the painting for sale.
and here they are. This is Miguel Hidalgo, Vicente Guerrero, Jose Maria Morelos. This is the beginning of Mexico. These are two of three of Mexico's most important figures, along with Benito Juarez. One of the last things I want to say is this idea of branding and tattoos. I don't have any tattoos. I'm not making fun of anybody who does have tattoos, but tattoos, it basically starts with the history of slavery, branding. And you can see they're branding, in this case, they're actually branding the, tat the, the slaves who are rebelling. But just like with cows, if you look at any cows, you'll see the branding of the owners. This is the same thing they did with slaves in all of the Americas, also in Mexico. And if a slave was really rebellious, they would put that mark on their face so everybody knows. So just like the United States and many parts of the Americas, slaves are for sale. In Mexico, in the year 1750, 1758, a male slave between the ages of 20 to 50 years old is going to be worth about 250, 300 pesos. A woman of similar age is going to be worth a little bit less. Children is going to be worth maybe 125 pesos, 150 pesos. Then you're going to have babies, 75 pesos. And those are very elderly and very sick, 25 pesos. La vida es mejor ahora o antes. Mira, yo recuerdo con mucho amor esa época de hace 20 años. No más, más. Uh, yo tengo 62 años, ¿no? Pero si hablo de hace unos 50 años, recuerdo algo bonito, porque <coughs> las personas vivíamos más en comunidad. Había ese recuerdo de que cenabas te salías al patio de tu casa, platicabas, eh, no había televisión, no había teléfono, entonces todo era platicar, jugar a los encantados, este, brincar la cuerda, eh, todo para mí esa época, yo la siento muy bonita, porque ahora en la actualidad no tienes tiempo de nada, es correr, ya no hay convivencia, ni entre hermanos, porque todos andan en la lucha por la comida, trabajando. Y yo me quedo con aquella época. Antes todo lo que se cultivaba era sano, o sea, no tenía insecticidas, no te enfermabas tanto, eras sano, porque iba, tu papá agarraba un conejo, lo hacía en molito y rico. Este, se cultivaban, este, eh, cortábamos el bledo, los ejotes, eh, los chipiles, yerba mora, eran comida. Entonces, y ahora todo lo tienes que, que comprar. Entonces, sí es más, más duro. Pero hay personas también dicen, nosotros ahora tiene caro, tecnología, um, más, más cosas, muchas personas tienen... Se tienen más cosas materiales, tienes una casa bonita si tú quieres, pero hablando de cosas materiales, pero de esa fraternidad se perdió, se perdió y ahora tu hermano no te va a visitar en la tarde y a decirte, este, vamos a cenar juntos. Y, y platicar cómo estuvo tu día, porque todos andan en la lucha de por, por sobrevivir. Y también, pues yo quiero creer que se empieza a tener eh, como eh, más deseos de tener más y más y más. Y antes era todo bonito porque nos conformábamos con tener nuestros alimentos y nuestra ropa. Eh, y no sin tener excesos y ahora la gente se va más por lo material se ha venido perdiendo ese amor por tu hermano por tu veo con tristeza que el hijo le pega a la madre que el 
la hija maltrató a su mamá, que la tumbó para que se muriera, cosas feas que en aquella época no existían. Había algo muy hermoso que era el respeto a las personas mayores. Nosotros estuvimos educados de tal forma que no había una persona mayor que te pidiera que le hicieras algún mandado o ve a comprarme y un obediente. Y a todas las personas mayores le decíamos tía, con respeto. Y le íbamos a hacer lo que la persona mayor nos pidiera, hacíamos con gusto. Sí, tía. Y ahora no. El sobrino te falta el respeto. Sí. Te dice que eres naca porque no sabes usar bien el teléfono. Entonces, ¿dónde está esa fraternidad, ese amor hermo hermoso que se tenía antes? Yo me quedo con aquella época. A mí, yo tengo recuerdos bonitos de aquella época. Mi mamá se va, este ollas, cazuelas de barro. En la noche, si yo quería, me podía ayudar a, ponía a ayudarle a, 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 a terminar las ollas, a rasparle para que por dentro estuviera suavecita la, la olla, la alisábamos con una piedrita. Pero mientras lo hacíamos, todo, platicábamos. ¿Qué, ¿Qué es lo que más te gusta aquí en Cuajenicalapa? ¿En la actualidad? Sí. Eh, aquí eh, me gustan muchas cosas, su gente. En Coajeniculapa somos personas que somos acogedores. Las personas ni bien las conocemos, ya le estamos brindando nuestro hogar. Sí. Entonces, sí, aún hay, hay buenos sentimientos en las personas, pero ya somos pocos las personas que quedamos.